So uh, an FTP team is here to talk to you about file transfer protocol and Alexander Reichschmel and Mark Heimers. Hello. Um, yeah, we're going to talk to you about a couple of things today. We're going to talk about uh, the roles of the FTP team within, within Debian. We're going to talk about the roles of the FTP team within Debian. Um, Alex is going to talk about the new queue, and then I'm going to talk about DAC. So we're going to start by introducing the FTP team as a whole. There are two groups of people, similar to the release team and various other ones there. We have people in the FTP master role. That's myself. Is that to me or somebody else? Myself, Mark Heimers, Jörg Gaspert, Genef down there, Torsten Werner. And as FTP assistant, we have Alexander Reich, Reich de Mike O'Connor, Ansgar, I'm sorry, Ansgar, I can't pronounce your surname. <laughs> and, and Luca, whose surname I also can't pronounce. As you can see, they let the only English person pronounce all of the German names. Alex is going to start by taking you through um, a lot of the things that we see in the new queue, but the, there are other roles for the FTP team also. Our main role is to make sure that the archive software keeps running, that updates come in, they get processed, they get checked against the GPG keyring, they get sanity checked, and then they get placed in the right location. <coughs> the other role, main role of the team is to, is to deal with keeping the archive legal. That used to simply mean looking at copyright licenses, making sure everything was notated properly, that we understood we didn't have anything really dodgy in there. That is becoming slightly more difficult recently with issues to do with trademarks and patents. There's going to be various discussions through DevConf on that, and obviously with Zach's um, work on the patent policy that FFLC did recently, that's all coming to the fore. The other things are supporting teams that depend on the archive. The release and security teams are the obvious people. And finally, updating the archive software as and when we need to. Oh, there we go, wrong button. What do we do? Well, as I said, we do the new queue. We decruft the archive, so some, are, some removals aren't automatic, some are. Um, we deal with override changes, and we deal with the archive kit maintenance. We don't, and this is a, sometimes a misunderstanding, we don't control the contents of testing. The gentleman sitting in front of me there, the release team, control the contents of testing. So when it goes wrong, blame them. And we don't deal with the build demons. We don't deal with bin NMUs. That's the build D team, and I can't see Phil Kern. Where is he? He's, he's missing, but that, 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 that's all his fault, effectively. So you need to complain to him about that, although we do provide mechanisms which help with some of these, these areas. I'm going to, for shameless self-praise, hand over to Alex, who uh, enjoys that sort of thing. Well, thanks for the, introdu oh, thanks for the introduction. Um, and I started by showing you the current state of the new queue, which is nearly invisible. I think I think as we are speaking, we have 20 packages in the new queue, and that's just <laughs> and that's just because I wasn't able to reject or affect some packages over the wireless LAN. Um, yeah. As you can clearly see, um, here's a small line uh, when squeeze was frozen. We have a continuous upload. I think at that point, someone complained that the new queue is growing so huge. So we started to accept some package until I think about here, we accepted a PostgreSQL version, which kind of broke the archive when the release team asked us not to accept any new packages anymore. So again, we have the usual crows during the freeze, and here, at that line, um, squeeze was released. You can, you can see also, um, well, it took us two months to recover from the release, and then just three weeks to clean the archive. Um, I think if you um, summarize the two stacks, we had about 900 new packages um, filling up the new queue during the freeze. And well, we pretty much managed to accept everything. Thanks also to the other people sitting there, um, especially Ansgar, who joined the team quite recently. And processed a huge amount of packages, if I'm not mistaken. 
So, um, yeah, nearly invisible new queue, so, well. But nonetheless, still packages end up in new and need to be processed. Oh, oh forgot something. Sometimes the release team even tells us we are processing packages too fast and they don't manage all their transitions because we add new packages. So that's pretty uncommon to us. <laughs> we are not used to hear these kind of compliments. So, now after the shameless self-praise, um, what's up about the new queue? Well, as we've mentioned already, one point of the new queue is to keep the Debian archive legal. Um, as a side effect, we also check if the packages meet the Debian free software guidelines. Some of us might be familiar with that document. And if they comply with the Debian policy. Um, you, some of you might wonder if there's a difference between complying with the Debian free software guidelines and being legal, legally distributable. But in fact, there are two different points because some piece of software can be free software, but still be not distributable. Think, for example, something combining GPL um, license code and S uh, SSL license code. <laughs> you can distribute that resource, but not as binary, if I'm not mistaken. So, and while we are at it, we also try to check a little bit is it's if it's actually sensible to have that package in the Debian archive. Um, so, in theory, there shouldn't be any need for processing the new queue because we all agree that that's a sensible things to comply to, aren't we? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, let me show you some examples. Um, from some recent rejects over the last two months, I think. Um, a common error, not all licenses are mentioned in your copyright file. Um, I think there's hardly any package in the archive which consists of only one license. I think that's the minority of our packages. So if you list only one license in your copyright file, you might better check it again. Um, in the dev scripts package, there's a small helper called license check, which can help you listing um, different licenses and copyright holders of source code. So I think that's the most common error, but the most common reason for a reject from the new queue. So next example, everything must meet the Debian free software guidelines. Um, I didn't invent that example. That's an actual package I found in the new queue, I think, two weeks ago. And it contains something copyrighted by something called the Microsoft Corporation. Um, I'm pretty sure that this doesn't meet the Debian free software guidelines. So, um, coming to our next example, stuff missing its source code. Often we find some kind of documentation, PDF files, um, which were not edited directly, which were not created directly by writing a PDF file, but with some other source, usually tech, sometimes open office files or LibreOffice files. And sadly, we often, we often don't find the source code of it. So, as the Debian free software guidelines say, we need the source code of it. That's usually a reject. Um, with the introduction of the dev format sweep.0, you can also ship the source code of some documentation in the debian.tar.gs, uh, well, the Debian tar file. And 
I think we had already one case where there was a piece of PDF documentation in the package. The source was not in the OIC tarball, but in the Debian tarball. Everything was built from source, so actually it was fine. But some FTP team member didn't notice that the source code for the documentation was not shipped in the OIC tarball and rejected the package. So if you do this kind of stunts, shipping source code not in the OIC tarball, you should mention that in the copyright file. And another common example is that you have some, ki some kind of source, source in quotation marks, which is actually not the preferred form of modification. Um, for example, JavaScript libraries are often minimized to strip them of comments and everything else to have a minimal version. Um, and if you then look at these files, you have just one single line containing all the code. Um, well, in theory, that is source code, yes, but it's not editable. You just can't go there and change, fix the source code or whatever. It's just not the preferred form of modification. Even if this JavaScript library is not licensed under the, licensed under the terms of the new general public license, um, we still want to have the thing you can actually edit. It has always been the interpretation of the Debian free software guidelines, and it will ever be, because we still want to modify it. So, with, uh, with increasing amount of web applications being packaged for Debian, that's also getting um, quite a quite common error. And then are some corner cases where you find some kind of file and actually no one knows what kind of file it is. In this case, it's some kind of data and, well, it's some kind of numbers. I have no idea what's, what the origin of these numbers are, what their meaning is, and what's the, how these numbers are usually edited. Um, we, we have said, yeah, kind of often, I would say, not in that form, but also in other forms where we get some data files. Sometimes you can't even fuse them with an ASCII editor. So um, what we usually do then is to ask the maintainer, what the hell is that? <laughs> um, so in, instead of rejecting it at once, we just asked, what is it? How would I modify it? And if we are satisfied with the answer, we accept the packages, of course. If not, well, we can still reject them. Um, if you want to take a shortcut, mention it in your copyright file. You, you might not know it, but the FTP team actually reads your copyright file. And if you have some, high, some hint added there, what is that file? How do I edit it? How do I edit it? With the, pack, with the software available in main, you can spare us one prod and we can accept your package right away. Um, and we have an FAQ document with the frequently asked questions. Why are some packages rejected? What you can mix with, what license you can mix and which license you can't? It's all documented. Um, on our FTP master side. And with that, I hand over to Mark again, who will tell us something about Duck. Okay. Well, Alex was going to let me say about Duck. He was meant to talk about removals and decrufts, but I'll do that instead. Um, most packages get... <laughs> Most packages get removed automatically through a mechanism called domination, which removes older versions in a suite. 
other versions in the suite once the maintainer uploads a new one, Brittany transitions it to testing or so forth. There are corner cases uh, where we can't do that automatically and therefore we have a tool called that Cruft report. This gives us a hint as to what we should look at removing. The reason we don't automate that is because there are times when we want to leave around old binaries of cert in certain cases. So uh, Ben Hutchings uploaded the 3.0 kernel uh, yesterday, it came through new, it's gone into unstable. That Cruft report is currently telling me that I really should be removing all of the 2.6639 kernel binary images from unstable at this point because it's looking at it going, oh, well, you've got a 3.0 source package now, so um, we don't need the 2.61 anymore. This is the reason we don't automate it. I think people would get fairly unhappy if we at this point threw out the kernel binary images and broke all installs of unstable. When Cruft report also deals with a few slightly more difficult cases, such as source packages getting renamed and taking over binary packages. The we often need to coordinate with the release team because this can quite often have an impact on transitions between unstable and testing, and it may be we need to hold around older library versions for slightly longer than we would otherwise like to. Uh, the final cases are binary packages built by multiple source packages, usually to do with a move, sometimes lack of coordination, sometimes other reasons. And finally, newer versions in unstable. So, for example, cleaning out, um, cleaning out old experimental versions or testing and testing proposed update versions. Although earlier today we have fixed it, so the release team can, to, can deal with the removals from testing proposed updates, and we no longer have to. The explicit RM bug reports tend to be things such as, I no longer wish to maintain this, it's not interesting, it's been merged into another package, and that's just usually filed through report bug. Uh, binary package removals on certain architectures. Although we try and support all packages on all architectures, there are cases where, for example, the tool chain breaks and we wish to migrate from unstable to testing. Brittany often won't consider this unless we remove the older binaries from unstable on the architectures where it's no longer building. Again, this is a partial removal which sometimes needs to be done manually. Overrides. Thanks, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> the override mechanism. Um, this is what actually writes the section priority headers into the packages and sources files rather than what's written in Debian control. When something comes in through new, it copies the information from Debian control into project B, the DAC database, which I'll come on to in a moment. But the information that's written in the packages and sources file is actually then taken from the database. To change it, therefore, we need bug reports against FTP Debian org. This is partially to prevent things such as, I don't know, LibreOffice becoming priority required, which would break the bootstrap, it would break other things. You would start dragging in a large amount of packages you really don't want to. Um, there probably are some questions about sections in terms of whether they should be being replaced with dev tags and all these sort of things in the longer term. Um, but we keep adding new sections because I've been saying that about dev tags since I think at least DevConf in Edinburgh, and we're still using sections at this point. There are a list of override disparities available on the FTP master website, although as the maintainer you'll get a really annoying email every time you upload if there's an override disparity, suggesting that you either correct the package or contact us to have the database updated. Okay, I'll get into the bit that I was, I was meant to be talking about, DAC. This is the Debian Archive Kit. It was renamed from KT, um, which was the initial name of the Python version of deinstall, written by James Troop and Co. many years ago, uh, which replaced the Perl deinstall script, which is where the terminology deinstall comes from. The terminology used by DAC is pretty much the same as that used in policy, except in one case, which does cause some confusion occasionally. A suite is something like old stable, stable, testing. Policy queues are a fairly new invention in terms of being generic within DAC. Not just new, but things like PU new or PU new, things that the stable release managers or the test testing release managers manage themselves as staging areas so that packages don't land straight in there. This is usually used for preparing a stable release. The one area where, the, for historical reasons, the terminology differs is that we call main contrib and non-free components, and we forget that other people call them other things. Some documentation in Debian actually calls them sections, and that is really, really unhelpful, because we, we get very confused with the actual sections, such as admin, doc, debug, Python, all that sort of thing. Priority, everyone knows about. Unchecked, you'll hear us refer to unchecked quite a lot. This is simply a directory on, the F on our Frank Debian org, current FTP master server, where we dump everything that hasn't been checked for sanity. 
this is where the QD eventually puts all of your files. DAC is very much something that's been evolved. It, wasn't, it, it was designed originally, but you can actually see, if you look, it was designed around the files that apt expects to see. So if you look at the release file format documentation, which is the apt source code, you will then see that the database was designed to contain those fields. The Python code was then written to generate a release file from the database. It wasn't designed to, well, how do we want to represent a suite? How do we want to represent sections? How do we want to tie all this together? It was very much, here are the file formats. Here's how we can quickly represent it in a database. Here's how we can script it to bring it all together. Reverse engineering is sometimes necessary, especially in the cases such as Cruft Report. Um, Torsten's the expert on Cruft Report domination and that sort of thing. We tend to leave it to him because he's spent enough time looking at the code to roughly understand where it will break should he change it. The test coverage is getting better but is still poor. Um, there are probably about 20 test cases in DAC. There probably need to be about 2,000, 3,000. And this is one of the reasons we're quite cautious when pack, patching it. The only major DAC install is currently the Debian FTP master one. That is the one that, that matters in many respects. We have a test machine called Floater, which we can give people access to. This has a copy of Project B, and you can play with your own branches and that sort of thing. And we would very much welcome people who want to hack on DAC, clean the code base. And if anybody wants to write test harnesses for this, um, please see me immediately. In fact, stop the talk right now, and uh, I will be quite happy to come and talk to you about writing test harnesses for DAC. There is going to be a boff on Thursday at 10 o'clock, and I'm going to mention at least three times between now and the end of the talk. We'd like to see anybody who has any Python and Postgres knowledge, or none, uh, but who would be interested in coding, as I said, especially in tests when um, Zach said earlier on about test-driven development. This really is an area where test, Debian testing could could do with improving. Yes, we, we're happy if everybody turned up. The important parts of DAC that um, maintainers will see are the scripts that I've listed here. Process upload is what takes your upload. It runs Lintian on it if it contains source. It checks your key is in the GPG keyring. It checks that it's not out of date. It runs a whole number of sanity checks. These sanity checks are not derived from first principles. These sanity checks are things that have broken in the past. Uh, again, as I said, DAC has evolved. When something broke the archive, somebody added three lines of code in the middle of process upload, usually in a random place, to check for that particular error. This means that process upload is quite inefficient, quite complex, but seems to do its job 99% of the time. Process policy is what the release team and the stable release managers use to shift packages around between the PU new queues and all that sort of thing. They write accept and reject files, DAC picks them up and performs the appropriate action. Process new is what we use to do a similar thing for the new queue. It has extra little features such as extracting the Debian copyright files, showing us it in a page or all that sort of thing, Hi highlighting in bright red where it depends, a, dep a package is dependent on which doesn't exist, all those sort of useful things so that we don't have to do the work manually. The override command is pretty self-explanatory. Control suite, however, is less so. This is how Brittany sets testing. It says to DAC, I would like these packages at these versions for these architectures, where architecture may be source, in testing, please. And it just feeds it a however many tens of thousands line, line long list once or twice a day. DAC looks at it and goes, that seems to be about right, and um, sets the entire of testing. Testing isn't updated from our point of view, testing is reset every single time. This resulted in one particularly poor instance in where we received a zero line testing file. And testing suddenly had no RC bugs. <laughs> Dominate is what I described earlier on. Dominate used to actually be tied in with actually exporting all the file lists, but we split it out. This deals with all the cases to do with um, getting all versions to go away. And more importantly these days, the reason that we have multiple arch all packages in a given suite is because Torsten massively improved the algorithm to hold architecture all packages around for longer. Those of you who've been around a few years will remember that if you used to be on any architecture other than I386 and somebody uploaded a fairly large package, you would suddenly find it became uninstallable on your architecture because the architecture all package for the old version had suddenly gone away. These days, we do our very best to hold on to the architecture all packages that are needed by those older versions, keep them in the packages files. It makes the older versions still installable on other architectures that weren't the initial upload target. 
generate package sources and generate releases. These very generate package sources is the replacement for apt FTP archive. It is quite a lot quicker and quite a lot more efficient because it used to be that we had all the information in the database, but we thought it would be fun to scan all of the files again and jump, dump it into a Berkeley DB cache using apt FTP archive before writing the packages file. Eventually, we got round to writing it out directly from the database, and apart from a few minor breakages to do with field orders that um, Steve McIntyre can tell you about for the Debian CD software, um, it now seems to pretty much work. Generate releases generates the two types of release file you'll often find in there to do information to do with the origin, information to do with um, what the suite is, all that sort of thing, and all the checksums. The database is, for historical reasons, called Project B, and there is a DD accessible live Postgres mirror kindly set up by DSA on Reese. That is a live streaming replica, so it, it, it will sometimes be out of sync with the actual pool that is on Reese by a little while. I think we now sync it every unchecked run. I'm looking at Jörg to tell me whether I'm right or not. So the files on disk should be just about in sync, but the database will always be the same as that on Frank. Uh, so if you're wanting to do any work, that's the place to do it. The install is now really a shell script that just runs the commands above in the right order most of the time and moves everything through queue unchecked, deals with the release team input, sends all the emails, and then asks everything out. And this runs, as we know, four, um, this runs four times a day um, at those times, UTC. Unchecked is processed every 15 minutes except during deinstall. So recently in DAC, we've improved the internal code to try and reduce duplication. There's a lot more of that to do. Anybody who is a real Python coder who looks at DAC might wonder what we were smoking when we wrote it. It is considerably better than it used to be. Um, Tursten, as I said, did the improved all version handling and the removal, and the removal of the FTP archive was handled by various people within the team. We also made the build DQ generation considerably more flexible, which was useful because it allowed us to expose, um, we didn't used to expose experimental um, as part of incoming. Incoming Debian org is now actually a faked up build DQ. It doesn't really exist because we don't have that stage anymore. It also means that incoming Debian org now actually satisfies all source code requirements because the orig will always be there. Finally, the build D auto sign integration was done with uh, Phil Kern and the other build D folks. This, this actually hadn't really come home to me until yesterday when I had to go back and process new four times in one day to get Linux, the Linux 2.6 binary packages through because they were coming straight off the build D straight into um, new because of the change in version number. I, ha I hadn't realized quite how much of an impact it has to ha not have the build D people in the middle having to do the, si the tedious work of signing repeatedly. It seems to have sp speeded up the um, si development cycle quite considerably. The current work we're looking at, um, XZ support for binary packages, that is now written, waiting, it's no longer waiting for review because I did it in the five minutes before this talk. Um, I just didn't want to merge it because I didn't want the first question in the talk to be why is the archives no longer working? So we're going to, immediately after the talk, we're going to stop the archive temporarily, merge the patch, and then run unchecked manually and hope that it still works. We'd like to do something to do with multiple archive support. This would be helpful for data Debian org, but also it would help us consider merging some of the multiple DAC instances we have around the project, security, backports, all into one place. It would actually minimize a large number of problems with file duplication. We'd also like better queue tracking. Some of these are sort of internal team matters, but a lot of the things where people say, I uploaded this and this didn't quite work are because we don't track the queues quite as well as we should do. And it is possible that Ridge tar GZs, for instance, disappear while something's waiting in a queue, at which point DAC will get very upset and refuse to move it to the pool. We've been asked by, and, I've, and Zach finally sent an email a couple of months back saying, yes, do it, to throw away binaries. Um, so the current plan is simply to throw away binaries that come in a changes file where there is also a source present. So therefore, people would be, if you uploaded a set of binaries on their own, they will still go through fine. So if you want to do a portrait upload or one of the corner case uploads, that will work. But by default, we will, if, there's, if you're doing it source plus um, binary, we'll keep the all binaries because that requires some build D support to work out how we build the all packages. Um, but anything which is an any binary package, we will just throw up throw away to one side after doing the Lintian checks, and the buildees will build them from clean each time. We've also had a bit of a chat about, because of the build the auto signing, it's now quite easy to recognize which binary packages were built by buildees. So it might be quite nice to have reports on the website about which package binary packages in the archive were built by non-buildee 
um, uploaders. On-demand experimental type suites and the PPA infrastructure, yes. One suggestion has been, and this came out before the PPA discussions actually, that experimental is useful sometimes. And in fact, we're about to make it more useful because we've had a request from the release team that people can migrate, people be able to migrate packages from experimental into unstable without re-uploading. Um, I've implemented the code for that, and actually, again, just before this talk, I tested on the test archive, and it actually worked second time. And we're going to try rolling that out soon. If anyone's got suggestions about how that should be interfaced with, I'd be glad to hear them. We're currently thinking a mail gateway or something, send a GPG sign mail saying, I'd like this to shift across. The mechanism doesn't really matter. But, yeah, a decode type commands file, be it via email, something that's signed. I'd like to move the following source packages at these versions from experiment and all their binaries from experimental into unstable without having to go through the build D network again. And this is, could be quite useful, you can imagine, for staging transitions. But this got us on to thinking that actually having a single suite where all that happens can be a bit difficult if there's multiple people using it. So it might be an idea that you could create an experimental dash glib transition suite do all of your work in there, get the build these to build everything experimental, then shift the whole lot into unstable in one go. And that might help with transitions, complex transitions uh, immensely. Now that requires a little bit of work, but if anybody's interested in working on that, which seems to me to be related in some generic ways to the PPA infrastructure, again, we'd be glad, like to talk about that at the boff. I'd really like to see DAC in Debian again, mainly because I use DAC at work to push out all of our local packages. And at the moment, I'm using a really old version, and upgrading it is going to be very annoying. So I would quite like DAC to actually be in the archive and apt get installable and usable. It used to be there, but it wasn't really usable. Bug fixing, there's always bugs. Debug debs and the Debian Smart Upload Server, I'm actually going to skip over because I'm going on a bit. Come to the BOF on Thursday. We'd like to, as I say, we'd really like to see people there. We'd like to have more contributors, be it people who want to work on the FTP team or people who just want to work on scripts, maybe not even in DAC, things related to the archive to try and make things run more smoothly. Uh, and I'll finish off by asking if there are any questions. No, good. I've sent everyone to sleep. When's the BOF? When's the BOF? Thursday at 10 o'clock, Neil. Thank you for asking that. <laughs> No? Good. Excellent. Oh, Zach's going to ask a question. Oh, dear. <laughs> Actually, you did a very good job at destroying any single question I had with your last slide in the future work. But I'm still curious if you... Th so, sometimes we hit the problem that the DAC machine is sort of a bottleneck, so we have had that problem in the past. So, mm -hmm. I wonder if you have reason from an architectural point of view whether DAC must be a single, you know, a single big lock on the archive or whether it can be distributed. DAC so no, in some way, the archive is a, a big lock in some sense, but I wonder whether it can be distributed well, in some way. You say that. The, the DAC lock, it's, it, if we're talking about locking in terms of mul you know, de it dealing with multiple things at once and people sitting around, that actually doesn't occur very much anymore. The install itself now is usually in the region of 20 minutes or so, 25 minutes, but since we've uh, changed how we process things. So it's, it's, not, it's nowhere near as bad as it used to be, where deinstall would be three hours long and nothing could happen in that time. We couldn't even process new during that time. We've actually made the locks a lot more granular. Um, and we only take the locks for the short period we need to ensure database consistency. One suggestion that has been raised in the past is actually some form of DAC daemon. And the reason for that would be that it would know what it was currently trying to do, and it would only take locks for those few seconds that it needed to make a consistent change to the archive. Um, if you know of cases where DAC is being a bottleneck rather than new as being a bottleneck or this as being a bottleneck, let me know and we can certainly look at it. And Colin's going to ask me a question, I think. Uh, so, in the past, we've uh, gone from uh, DAC running, or deinstall, sorry, running every day down to twice a day, four times a day. Do you have plans to uh, increase the frequency further? This gets, uh, this gets, asked, this gets asked occasionally. Uh, technically, we can do There are a couple of things that you've got to remember. First of all, the mirror back. Sledge is shaking his head, and he's one of the people who always shakes his head whenever we say maybe we could go six times a day. Would somebody give Steve a microphone? Because I'd really like him to explain to me why he always shakes his head when this is raised. <laughs> Um, I agree with him. The thing is, the mirror bandwidth is quite large because don't forget, you regenerate the disks tree for testing unstable experimental. Sure, we, we do it in Ubuntu. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Sorry, Colin, just for those of any, anybody who couldn't hear him, he said uh, they do that in Ubuntu, and he was just, sort of just asking about that. Steve? 
Sure, yeah. The problem, of course, is exactly mirror bandwidth. Yeah. I mean, I'm responsible for a couple of mirrors and it's painful. The other problem is then also um, the CD builds. We, d we don't want to be generating too many. We're already halving, so we do a set of dailies twice a day instead of every four, every four times a day. Okay. We could cope with more and, again, just artificially limit. Mm -hmm. um, the, the next question is, what do we gain from running any faster? That was what I was going to ask. I mean, do people think that the, the number of mirror pulses at the moment, the six hours between them, really affects them? I, Colin's, Colin's got no comment. Yes, thank you. Um, so, I mean, they're, they're obviously a very different project, but we, we did notice very clearly that, be, that having a mirror pulse every hour, as we do in Ubuntu, means that the development uh, cycle tends to sync a little bit more to mm -hmm. that, and uh, it makes it, e it means that you know you can you can try something out, uh, upload it, have it built. It will almost certainly be done and ready to upgrade from only about a quarter of the way into your workday, and. Uh, that kind of thing makes it possible to well, do, one of the things do a lot have, of things more yeah. quickly. I mean, one of the things we have to remember is that I, I could be wrong, you'll correct me. I think um, Ubuntu has a much more control of their mirror network than we do. We rely on volunteer mirrors considerably uh, more, don't we? I don't. I, I don't know that that's true for that, that's true for our central mirrors, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, not perhaps for. I'd be interested. Out. I'd certainly be interested to see we some should, numbers. We should, talk we should about yeah. It. I think I'd be interested to see some numbers, and Ganeth would know better than I would, on how much of the sync is actually the disks tree and how much is the debs. I suspect we're at the point where, with six hours, they're becoming the influence of the disks tree is becoming quite high compared to that of the change in actual deb and source files, and that seems to me to be about the point at which you start saying that's probably enough of a trade-off. Yeah. We have something like multiple hundred megabytes in the disk tree for every mirror run. Right. And Wiesel could tell you exact numbers, but he's already bitching at us <laughs> from, from the snapshot point of view. That's true. The other thing is we have to remember that snapshot, and uh, we wouldn't want to sort of upset them too badly because th they would have to snapshot, or they wouldn't have to, but they snapshot the disk tree every time we do it. And obviously that imposes extra resources on them. Certainly, if we, if we thought it was going to have a large effect on development, it might be worth an experiment of even just trying it six times a day instead of four and seeing if it makes much difference. And we do have a good number of mirrors that are taking actually a long time and are about finished when we are starting the next one already. There is one they will really love us if we go more. Yeah. There is one thing that has literally just sprung into my head and is a very half-formed idea, and the fruit is going to come from here at this point to be thrown at me. We have traditionally made incoming not have a packages file. No, no, yeah, what we could do <laughs> would be to consider syncing that to one or two mirrors and generating a packages file, even just using apt FTP archive there, so you could have an additional, um, this is what's coming in at this point that developers could use. We, it, there are other workarounds rather than going through the main mirror network that could be used for people if they wanted to see that in the, in the, to help with development. Let's discuss that outside. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds ominous. <laughs> Does anyone else have any questions? Uh, Sledge. I don't think it'll be that much of a problem. Okay. Just start, eh? Fairly obvious question. I mean, I'm, I am one, I guess, one of the consumers of your output, and I've, I've, we've been reporting bugs and whatever for the last few years. Yep. Are there any more, um, I guess, interface changing changes coming that, that you can warn me about? Define interface. Project well, things like the format of, a, of the sources file, the packages the file, that kind of thing. Not that I'm aware of. The big change was when we cut over to no longer using apt FTP archive. Sure. Um, I, re I realize this isn't much comfort, but I mean, given it's an RFC 822 file, we, didn't th we hoped that all the parsers wouldn't care what the ordering was. That was probably a little bit stupid in retrospect. We tried to keep it as close as we could to the original, but we, we made mistakes, and I'll hold my hands up to that. Um, so hopefully that's hopefully that's been finished. The in terms of interfaces, one thing we don't guarantee, if I can just say, is at the moment the Project B schema. We don't want to guarantee that we will keep that the same. The reason is it's bloody horrific, and we would really quite like to clean it up considerably. I think at that once we clean it up, we should look at possibly providing some stability. Sorry, Ganeth. Oh, sorry. I'll, I'll, do you want me to repeat that? Contents. Well, I, uh, ah, there we go. 
We are also thinking about changes to the contents file, but probably they are done by adding new files and slowly removing the old ones, yeah. getting them in some more usable format and also adding source contents and stuff. But I think that is a case where we would keep generating the old files, but produce new files with different names, and then gradually, hopefully, after over a couple of release cycles, um, cycle out the old file, file types. Hello. Hello. Uh, I wonder if you have considered about carrying part to, uh, partial architectures. Can we see like architectures going out and in and... Are you Andy Both dressed up? Because he just grabbed me about that immediately before the talk. Um, <laughs> partial architectures, yes, Andy's asked to talk to me about that. Um, I see the release team staring at me about that because Brittany would have to cope with it. There are, and I'm hoping Con's about to tell me there's no need for it. Oh, that's right, okay. Partial architectures are things like, in the past, examples have been PPC64, Spark64. I've never been entirely convinced it was worth not just building those as full architectures, but Andy did come up with an example that might be worthwhile beforehand, but I've forgotten what it was. So the idea being you could build a limited set of um, packages because you don't need the whole of the archive optimize that particular way. I've been told five minutes, so I'll probably just take cones and then finish. Can I just say one other thing about that? I think that is going to become an issue, especially with now multi-arch becoming production ready. Things like uh, I386 or I686 or I386 MMX or whatever, where we might want certain libraries to be available in optimized forms. That might be the way we end up doing that. It's also used or can be used for getting rid of the current Spark port and getting Spark 64, for example, mm -hmm. transition without having a completely new architecture added and remove the old one. Yeah, um, but certainly, yes, partial architectures we've considered. DAC actually cares very little about the completeness of, a, of the um, component. In fact, when I say very little, I mean not at all. Um, Brittany, compares about the com Brittany cares very much about the, cl the cl set closure over main, but we don't. Colin, let me finish with that. Uh, so you may not have greatly the sympathy for this. Uh, the sledge asking about uh, interface changes reminded mm. me, and in conjunction with your, your comment about support for data that's tar that's that's um, So I'm one of the poor sods running a downstream distribution that uh, occasionally needs to keep up with new facilities that yeah. Debian introduces. Uh, we're a about two weeks behind you, I think, on data tire um, is there is there anywhere uh, something that resembles a change log of new interface features that DAC supports relative to Other than Debian Git developers? Log, no, yeah, it's um, a bit that's noisy. not particularly helpful because it's of the number noisy. of yes. I, I this has bothered me for some time, and I'm wondering if we should coordinate slightly better with the derivatives on that and also as a, pro on, as a project as a whole because Datatar XZ has been around for a while now but there are bits missing in the stable tool chain that um, are having to be hacked, had to be hacked around or introduced in the point release so that we could use it so that the features could be used. Nice. I wonder if this nice. is actually not just for the derivatives, but for Debian as a whole, something we should look at um, coordinating slightly better. Right, Debian as a whole, and uh, I've, I honestly don't know what derivatives other than Ubuntu do. I know that many of them use DAC in some way. I don't know whether they're keeping up with your Git tree or whether yeah. they're doing all their own stuff. I'm sure we can't be the only people with this, uh, yeah. with this problem. I, I think it might, it, it's another example of where cross-distribution, but also in, internally within Debian, it would be. The, an example that was brought to my attention the other day is that the bootstrap, I believe, will only cope with Datatar GZ. That's so correct. we have to be yes. careful not to end up with Datatar BZ2 or Datatar XZ in um, packages that or, the bootstrap needs to deal or, with. Or, or we need to change that assumption, but we need Absolutely, to... But but we need to but again, really that's an example yeah. possibly that we've mis we haven't coordinated properly. Ganef wants to say something, and I think I've got to finish. No, he's finished. Oh, Sledge is back again. Yeah, yeah I'll finish with that. A um, couple of last things. Um, in terms of mirroring, mm. and it's a really silly question, I could check anyway. Are you generating packages.gz and whatever as are syncable? Yes. Okay, lovely. And finally. Okay, cool. And. Are you ready for us to start doing ArmHF that, like, very soon within the I next sent, month? I sent an email about ArmHF when we met yeah. six months, not six, three, three, four months ago. Yes, um, as soon as you're ready to bootstrap it, 
give me a shout, we'll add the architecture in unstable, dump in the initials, and go through the usual architecture bootstrapping procedure, which is even written down somewhere. Just don't <laughs> ask me where it's written down. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, that's it, I think. Thank you.